Hello, welcome to the Asian Conference on the Social Sciences and the Asian Conference on Sustainability, Energy and the Environment. My name is Joseph Haldane and I'm the Executive Director of IFOR, the International Academic Forum, the organising body behind these conferences. Today I'm joined by Mr Lowell Shepherd, who's the Asia Pacific Director of the HOPE International Development Agency. Lowell's been involved with HOPE uh, for 35 years but um, for the past 15 years he's served here in Japan as the Asia Pacific Director of the HOPE International Development Agency which he founded in this country. Lowell, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here, Joe. So today you talked about individual communities and society as a way of um, resolving conflicts um, through synergies. Now you've been involved in different conflict areas throughout your career, um, but notably um, in uh, Bosnia. Um, can you tell us a bit more about um, how you came to be in Bosnia and, and what you were doing in Bosnia? Well, I've always been involved in community service, community development. I was living in England at the time of the war breaking out. And like everybody else in Europe, we were shocked to see war once again on European soil. Um, and we felt we had to do something. So initially we thought we'd just raise some money to help with displaced people, uh, particularly in Croatia, which we had access to. So we took a film crew down, uh, went to a refugee camp, made some contacts, and we thought that would be the end of it. But we met a young couple at that point who were returning to the city of Mostar uh, for the children that were being kept there, not kept against their will, but because of ethnic cleansing, the military on all three sides didn't want to vacate communities because it created a vacuum for cleansing to happen, ethnic cleansing to happen by default. So Nicola and Sandra were there wanting to help these children uh, in their education, try to keep a school open. And uh, so they asked for my, our con con continued support. And, um, and uh, you know, there's many other parts of that story, but the long and short of it was they became very good friends. I visited many times. They, they were able to get 46 children out on a holiday to the coast on the agreement with the military that they would bring them back. When they were just about to go back into Mostar, they phoned me up in England and they said, Lowell, we've got you permission for you to come in with us, with a film crew, the first time in six months that any, and we weren't journalists, but there were no journalists for months in, in Mostar. So I remember flying down, boarding the bus up in Zrkvenica in the North Croatian coast, uh, driving all the way back to Mostar, it took many, many hours. And as we, uh, start to descend down to the Naretva Valley, suddenly heavy artillery fired just above us, not at us. I hit the deck. I mean, I was just panic-stricken, thinking we were being shot at. The kids applauded, saying, oh, they're welcoming us home, which they weren't. They were actually lobbing shells over, trying to hit the bridge, the Starry Most, in fact. But to them, that was a sound of home. And, and it was home to them and they were back home. So again, they were not coming against their will. And just such an emotional bond was made. We, we, what had happened, if I could just say this, Joe, we, uh, a, a couple weeks before, we had been talking with a Simon Hughes MP and a, and a mutual liberal friend, Democrat, liberal, yes. liberal Democrat. What would it take to stop the war in Sarajevo? Sarajevo was the focus. And Simon says, we should just get a million people and march in. We were kind of fresh off of Manila and the people power revolution there. Uh, and uh, it was a nonsensical idea, uh, but it made us all think. And I went home and I said to my wife, you know, what, what if an opportunity presented for myself to actually go into the war zone, what would I do? Um, and concluded with my wife that if our town was under siege, and I was able to get a friend in from outside to, re to take news back out and help us, and that friend didn't come, I'd be pretty ticked off. So you, so you felt a moral I felt a moral responsibility. responsibility. And then this, then this opportunity came. So it wasn't out of a sense of adventure, heroism. I mean, I, I was scared. And so so, so that, that touches on something quite interesting when, when we talk about charity work, because um, charity work can be dangerous and it can involve often going into um, areas where sometimes it's uncomfortable but often where, in, in this case, where, where lives are at risk. Um, one of the things that um, 
I'd like to touch upon is how a charity worker or a soldier, for example, deals with being in proximity but doesn't have the ability to help in the way they might like to or, or find an immediate resolution. Well, I, I can't speak for soldiers except for the one I asked advice from once, a UN soldier in Medjugorje just outside of Mostar. And his advice to me was, you have to turn the volume down on your emotions. So have you, um, taking that into account, have you managed to turn the volume down on your emotions? And is that something that you do? Um, because you, you have a split life between a, a very affluent community here where you fundraise and then going to different parts of the world. And of course, as we know in Bosnia, in uh, war-torn places or, or even in, in the present in Southeast Asia. Well, it, it, it kind of makes sense. You know, you have to be professional. You have to remain rational. But being rational, being emotional, are not, it's not contradictory. The emotion can inform our, our cognitive processes. Um, but my premise is, though, you can't turn your emotions off. That's to be inhuman. You, you, you have to care, and, and you have to let, let the disturbance, the, the anger, the grief, motivate you to do something that is, lo that is constructive and logical. And channel that. And, and, and channel that. And, and I think, um, as I shared in the session this morning, if you look at the, the people that people admire, it's always the selfless people, the Mother Teresa's, the Nelson Mandela's, people who go beyond uh, being self-serving. Now, even altruism is kind of self-serving because it makes us feel good better about ourselves. It's like the story of Abraham Lincoln being driven home and he sees a pig wallowing in the mud and he tells the driver, stop the cart or what, the coach, whatever it is. And he got out and dirtied his tux, rescuing the pig. And the driver said, that was a very selfless thing you did tonight, President, Mr. President. And Abraham Lincoln said, no, not at all. If I hadn't done it, I wouldn't have been able to sleep. So, so all of our motivations are always mixed up. But I think to be effective and to be human, you, you have to care. Uh, I also understand the logic that you can't be standing there crying all the time. You've got to toughen up and you, you've got to and discern to and find ways to help. So Yolanda, for example, uh, our Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, um, the last thing they needed was a bunch of people pouring in there. Uh, and a lot of organizations, and that I don't... That was the same thing with Tohoku, wasn't it? And it was the same thing with, with Tohoku. Um, and and uh, there were too many volunteers in, in, in Tohoku. But yet you have to find your way through that maze of mixed motivations and do something that's, that has clarity to it. So with, with Yo Yolanda or Haiyan, uh, to access Japanese government money, we knew that somebody from Japan had to go and in and appear to do the assessment. So even though we have strong contacts on the ground who could have just said to us by telephone, we need X amount of dollars, uh, I personally had to go just to say that I went. Yeah. And of course, I'm touched by it and everything else. And I see all these individuals I want to help, and some of them became my friends. But ultimately, I know I'm there just so I can go back and say I was there. Yes. And that visit basically uh, triggered uh, almost $400,000 in, into the Philippines. And then my colleague Fumi uh, then had to accompany the money back yes. and be there and kind of take pictures and, and monitor. Sure. So, so it, it is a complicated thing. And you know, some, I'm sure some people thought, why did he, you know, is he an adventure seeker? Why did he go to the Philippines? Uh, and that, you know, you, so you have to understand the reasons why you're doing. Well, that's great. Well, we're, we're very proud here at IFL to be affiliated with the Hope International Development Agency, and we uh, wish you all the best as you uh, continue with your good work. Um, thank you very much for joining us, and um, I hope that you too might be able to um, come to a future IFL conference. Um, please keep um, up to date with the latest developments on our Facebook page or by looking at our website, www.ifl.org. Thank you very much.